today we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit, uh, indwelling of the Holy Spirit, and we're going to talk about it, uh, about the temple. Now, I, I realize uh, this may not be the most common association we have with the indwelling and temple, but as we do the lesson, hopefully it becomes so clear that we have to contextualize uh, the Holy Spirit and his presence in terms of temple. So let me just uh, ask an opening question and you will please uh, unmute and answer. You don't have to raise hands or anything. We're very formal here. Uh, when you hear the word temple, uh, what comes to your mind? I think when yeah, that comes to me, my mind is a place of worship. <laughs> Holiness. Sacred. Yeah, it's a I place think, where, think... where God dwells, his presence dwells, yeah. where you will find God. I think of a scripture that says, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Mm. I think for me, the first thing that comes to mind is the building where you worship, but more for other religions. I, I don't immediately think Christianity. I think, you know, Buddhism, Judaism, and other religions. That's the first thought, the building itself. Hello. Anyone else? Yes. Hello, Manu. Yeah, those are some great uh, responses. Uh, and, and I would agree uh, with Makana. You know, when you think of temple, you don't think Christianity immediately. You think other religions. And so today's study, hopefully, we help to see uh, uh, see. Uh, the context of temple as we think about and talk about the Holy Spirit. So let's start back in Genesis. And in Genesis, let, let me just say this. When you read through Genesis 1, please don't end in verse 31 because it actually continues on to chapter 2, verse 3. Don't ask me why they divided the Bible in that way <laughs> and who decided to do that. I don't know. <laughs> But when you read through Genesis 1, please continue past verse 31. And in chapter 2, verse 1, the Bible reads, Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Then God made, blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it, he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. Now, I'll be the first to admit, for the longest time, I used to read this and not quite understand why did God have to rest? You know, it's like, was he tired? What's going on? I couldn't quite figure out. And it was a question I left. I left it because I couldn't figure out the answer. Well, thankfully, there's scholars that do a lot of research and um, and study a lot of things and so on. And so um, scholars who have studied ancient Near East literature, that is literature that's comparable to the time the Genesis was written in that time period, what they discovered is that this building of, this creating, creation story of seven days is very comparable to building of temple in the ancient Near East. And what they found is that on the seventh day, when people will build temples, they, they'll build it to whatever idol would come and rest in the temple on the seventh day to be with the people. Now, the author of Genesis takes that and guided by the Holy Spirit, of course, turns it upside down and says, you know what? This is the picture of God coming to rest with his creation that he made. In other words, is to come and be with his creation. The analogy that I can think of 
is imagine, uh, maybe you don't have to imagine, I know I've had a pretty long day today. I'm sure a lot of you have, have had a long day. Uh, and so imagine coming home after a long day's work and what do you do? You take off your shoes or what have you and you sit on the couch and you rest. You're with your family, you home. And that's the picture of God dwelling amongst his people, God coming to be with his creation that Genesis 1 and chapter 1 and 2 is really presenting. God creates us to come and be with us, be home, be family. And if you're not convinced with that explanation, check out Genesis chapter 3 and verse 8. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. I'll read the sec next section in just a second. But notice God is walking in the garden with his creation. He is with his creation. There's no separation. And that's really the picture of the cosmic temple. Creation itself is this temple where God's space and human space are one space. Or at least that's how it was. So sin came into the world. And so what happens in Genesis 3 verse 8? Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And there it is. The consequence of sin is now separation. There's a divide. And God's space and human space, has there's a fracture, a break. And we see that in Genesis 3, verse 27, um, I mean, 24, sorry, or 23, rather. So the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. And in verse 24, after he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden, cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. So this is the story of God creating humanity to come and be with humanity, to rest with his creation and his creation rejecting him and hiding from him. As a result of sin, there is now exile. Humanity is banished. And now there is a separation between God's space, which we call heaven, and human space, which we call earth. And so the temple is supposed to have integration of God's space, human space, is now broken up. So the question then becomes, what is the next step? And so God calls a subset of humanity. And you see that in Genesis 12, verses 1, 2, and 3, and says, through you will come a people through whom the whole of humanity will be blessed. And when we look at Exodus 40, we find this people through whom God was going to bless all nations, the nation of Israel, they themselves find themselves in Egypt, enslaved. In other words, they are experiencing exile in Egypt. And God rescues them with a mighty hand. And the next thing he does, he does two things. One, he gives them the commandments. He gives them the law. To form them as a people. To teach them how to live as God's people. And then he gives them instruction on how to build the tabernacle. Which is basically a mobile temple. And in Exodus 40, the last chapter of Exodus, verse 34. We see then the cloud covered the tent of meeting. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses could not enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled on it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. So there we have God dwelling among his people. Not all of creation yet, but a subset of creation with the intent that through that subset, God will dwell among all his people. And that's, that's why the Bible is relational. It's not a distant God far away directing human affairs, but it's God with his creation because he loves us. Unfortunately, the people 
through whom God was to bless the world, they themselves behave no different than the rest of humanity. Uh, and uh, we find that the mobile tabernacle eventually becomes a permanent structure, a permanent temple. And you can read about that in First Kings. Um, and that's, the, that's Solomon's temple. If you have heard of Solomon's temple, that's what that means. It's Solomon's temple that was built as a permanent structure where God will dwell among his people. And uh, it's quite a fascinating uh, structure. And, and it's, it's really the, the, the temple became the nexus, the connecting point between God's space and human space. It wasn't just um, architectural or uh, symbolic. It was literal that God's space, human space met in the temple in Jerusalem. And you can read about it in First Kings chapter 6. But if you had to guess the next step in the story, based on our human tendency, you can guess that the people, uh, that, that uh, the, where God's space dwelt with human space, the temple in Jerusalem, the people, God's people would do exactly what rest of humanity does, which is to reject God and worship idols. And so look what happens in Ezekiel chapter 10. A very tragic thing happens. It's an exceptionally sad thing happens. In Ezekiel chapter 10, in verse 4, we read, Then the glory of the Lord rose from above the cherubim and moved to the threshold of the temple. The cloud filled the temple and the court was full of the radiance of the glory of the Lord. Then uh, the sound of the wings of the cherubim could be heard as far as the outer court, like the voice of God Almighty when he speaks. And then in verse 18, the tragedy, the glory of the Lord departed from over the threshold of the temple and stopped above the cherubim. So there we find as you saw in Exodus 40, the glory of the Lord in the mobile tabernacle, which was then in the permanent structure in Solomon's temple, departing because of human sin. And so again, there's that fracture, the break between God's space and human space. And the story repeats itself from Genesis 1, Genesis 3, all the way to Ezekiel chapter 10. Last week, uh, Lowe referenced Ezekiel 37, the valley of dry bones, which again makes this promise of some rest, of restoration taking place, of, of in effect new creation happening, resurrection taking place. But how and, and, and when is still left uh, as a mystery. Till Jesus arrives at the scene. So check out what happens in Mark chapter 2. Maybe you've heard this story or read this in the, in the Gospels. Uh, we'll have a look at it from a different perspective. In, in Mark chapter 2, we find uh, the four friends that help, uh, help their, uh, their, their friend uh, be healed, their paralyzed man be healed. So in Mark chapter 2, verse 1, a few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. Some men came bringing to him a paralyzed man, carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and then lowered, lowered the mat the man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now we read this and we don't think much about it because this is Jesus. Of course, he can forgive sins. But if we transport ourselves back in time to this day and age and ask ourselves who had the ability or, or the, the permission to forgive sins, the answer is the temple, the temple in Jerusalem. Because for the Jewish community, the temple was the nexus, the connecting point between God's space and human space. So what Jesus is doing here would be 
not mistaken by them at all. They understood very clearly that Jesus is saying, I am the temple. I am God's space and human space in one space. And therefore, he has the authority to forgive sins. And it would obviously be shocking. How can a human being be the nexus of God's space and human space? How can they be the temple? Well, when we go back to Genesis, that's exactly what God designed us to be. Right? He created creation itself as the temple. And he created human beings as his image bearers and him dwelling amongst his people, him coming and resting with his creation. We are meant to be the temple. We chose not to be that. We chose to say, no, we don't want to be your temple. In fact, we want to be the temple of our own idols. And God uh, exiles humanity, but he doesn't give up on humanity because he loves us. And so Jesus being the cosmic temple in human form is actually very consistent with the narrative of the Bible. God wants human beings to be the nexus, the connection point between him and creation. That's who he made us to be. Now, that's maybe something you may have not considered as a walking temple, but that's really what we are. We are a walking temple where God's space, human space intersect. Now check out what Jesus says in John 15, actually in John 14. In John 14, verse 15, Jesus says, if you love me, keep my command, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he lives with you and will be in you. This is, the, this is incredible and I hope and pray we can just let these verses marinate in our innermost being. Because when we think of the Holy Spirit, and I'll be the first, maybe you're not, maybe you're not doing this, but I know I have for the longest time I've seen the Holy Spirit maybe in other ways, like, like a party trick. And that's sometimes is how he's presented, right? Like he can do miracles, he's the mag he does magic, and, and that's kind of the, the presentation of the Holy Spirit. But when we consider that this is very relational, because God is exceptionally relational, and notice the, the reality that Jesus says will happen, he will be with you forever. You know him for he lives with you and will be in you. That is exceptionally relational. And this is not a new invention in the New Testament. This goes all the way back to Genesis 1, where God creates the cosmic temple so he can be with his creation. Isn't that amazing? That the creator of the universe who spoke everything in existence by merely speaking, whose power is infinite, wants to be with us, wants to live amongst us, wants to uh, uh, dwell with us. He wants us to be with him. And he wants a community to be um, with, his, uh, with him and be with each other. And, and his presence is present in the world through his creation, through his image bearers. We are God's presence. In the present. This isn't some when we get to heaven, we'll be with God, although that's true also, very important. But it's right now. His presence is present in the present in us. That's what he wants. But God is not going to force his presence onto us. That's why he, he's present and he wants us to be present with him. His presence present with us willingly. So we're the temple. Check out 1 Corinthians 6. If you're still not convinced, you're like, I don't know. That seems like crazy talk that we're the temple of the Lord. Well, 1 Corinthians 6. Check out what 1 Corinthians 6, among other scriptures, um, 1 Corinthians 6, verse 18. I'll start in verse 18. It says, flee from sexual immorality. Why? 
is this some kind of Christian morality that's been presented? Not at all. Check out what it says. Continue reading. It says, flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Verse 19, do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit? Whom you have received from God. You're not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Isn't that incredible? We are God's temple. We are walking tabernacles of the Lord. His presence is present with us so we can be his presence wherever we are present. That's a bit of a tongue twister. But his presence is with us so that wherever we are present, his presence is present with us. We're supposed to be God's presence wherever we go, both as a collective community and as individuals who belong to the collective community. So when you go to work, when you drive, now this is hard for me because uh, I'll be the first to admit, when I drive, I can get uh, very irritated. And so I have, but this, this study has helped me to go, how am I being the presence? How, how is God pre present in my driving? Right, because that is really what we are. As Google mentioned, I think I see her mentioning this. Um, yeah, that, that's right. That we are the temple of the Lord. Isn't that incredible? When we go to work, when we in our homes, uh, wherever we are, we are God's temple. And that's the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. He's not, he's not magic or uh, something odd or something exotic he is the very presence of god dwelling amongst his creation being his presence wherever we go we're taking the temple with us we're bringing god's presence now i know for some of you maybe your work environment is just this you like uh, the lord will never be in this environment i can show you of that i worked in places like that where like okay you know what i'm pretty sure god's not going to be here well, that's what he wants, is us bringing his presence into our workplace, which is a tall order. Um, and how do we do that? Through prayer, through community, through vulnerability, uh, to, through a meditation, through humility. But that's what we are to be, is God's presence, his temple. Check out Revelations 21. So this is there's this concept called already, but not yet. This is one of the keys to understanding the New Testament is that something has already happened, but not yet fully happened. And that's the same thing with temple. We are the temple already, but not yet. Look what happens in the final future in Revelations 21. And we'll start in 22. I did not see a temple in the city. And immediately you go, what? We just spoke about the temple from Genesis 1 all the way through. But in, here in, Genesis, in Revelation 21, 22, it says, I did not see a temple in the city. Why? Because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and the Lamb is its lamp. The nations will walk by its light, and kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. On no day will its gates ever be shut, for there will be no night there. The glory and honor of the nations will be brought into it. Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. This is the final future where creation itself, remember going back to Genesis 1, how creation is the cosmic temple and how that that has been disrupted because of human sin. Well, creation is back to being the cosmic temple because God and the lamb are the temple itself. And those who dwell in the temple, God's people are now with God as, as intended in Genesis one. So Genesis one to Revelation is this big detour, but God will not be um, mocked. God cannot, God's plans cannot be uh, so, so, subverted. He's God, and so he's almighty, and so his plans will be realized. 
And at this point, I'm sure we're all asking, man, what would the world look like if there was no human rebellion? We wouldn't, Genesis 1 to Revelation 21 would be literally one line, you know. The Bible would literally end in Genesis 2 verse 3. But unfortunately, because of human sin, we have to go through this long detour. But I want us to just focus on, think about God's Holy Spirit, not as something exotic or some miracle or magician or, or um, something that we kind of like a party trick, but instead to see God's Spirit as very much the reality of God's desire for relationship to be with his creation. And he's offering that today. The invitation is available today because of Jesus' death and resurrection. And, and the hope is we all will actually submit to him and say, yes, Lord, come be with us. I want to turn away from my way of being and, and surrender to you. And that's what the Bible calls repentance. Repentance simply means turning from going from one direction, you're turning around and you're turning to the Lord. And to give up our agenda, to lay down our lives and enter into Christ. That's what the Bible calls baptism. Baptism is us dying to ourselves and God raising us to new life. And God's Holy Spirit done, comes, dwells in us to be his temple as we are now part of his temple community. And we bring God's presence wherever we are present. Even in, in fact, most more specifically in the places where uh, there, there's a desperate need for God's presence. And our communities, our neighborhoods, our families, our, our, our work environments, our campuses, wherever we are. And, and obviously uh, we know the challenges that South Africa is facing. I realize we have people from Mauritius. So I'm sure Mauritius also is facing challenges. How can we, and sometimes I, I know we, I wonder like, how, what can I do? How can one person make a difference? But the answer is that we're not one person. We have God's spirit dwelling in us to be his mobile tabernacle. And we have a community that is God's temple. And we have more power than we realize. And for us to be that presence of the Lord, because God is present in us. Now, I want to close out by asking if you have the Holy Spirit. And that's a fair enough question. And if, you, if you're wondering, I'm not so sure. I'm not, I don't know. Maybe I do, maybe I don't. This is something you want to know 100%. That, that, am I right? Like You don't want any kind of doubt there. Um, and if there is, we're here for you. We're, we're a community. We love you, want to be with you, talk to you, communicate, you know, just find out what's the, what is the challenge, what's the concern, what, you know, wh how, why do you feel you don't have it, why do you feel you, whatever. This is a relational space, not a judgment space. And so Ronald is going to post the, um, the contact link, which you can, it's a Google sheet. So you can just click on it and put down your name and whatever details is asked on the form and we'll come, we'll, we'll get back to you. Uh, and again, it's just a, it's just not a judgment zone or anything like that. Honestly, it's our heart is just to, to love you, encourage you, um, support you. We don't know who you are. Like there's a lot of people on this call. And so we want to get to know you because God's desire is relational and he wants to dwell with us. He wants to dwell with all of us. And this itself is an amazing message to share with our friends. Hey, God wants to live with you. And uh, he wants to be with you. And he wants his presence to be in your life. And for you to be his presence wherever you go. And that's an amazing uh, picture to keep in mind. That we are God's temple. And God wants to dwell with us. And so as we close out, uh, I'll, there's enough time for uh, discussion or comments or questions. There's about 20 minutes left um, to just, again, think about the Holy Spirit from that standpoint of temple and of indwelling as God's presence with us, in us, as we go, we take his presence with us. Thank you so much for your attention. And hopefully this message has been helpful. Um, I can post, as you 
share and comment. I'll post these scriptures on the chat so you can go study it out for yourself. And if you have any more questions, please do fill out the form. So I'm happy to reach out to you and we can engage in more conversation. So thank you so much. Uh, I'll stop talking now so you can uh, share, comment, ask questions. Um, so it's your time to, to speak. Thank you so much, Pro Raj. Um, I think there was a question that was asked by uh, Annette. Um, what's the practical way uh, to honor God with our bodies? Oh, that's a great question, Annette. Thank you. Um, what's the practical way to honor God with our bodies? Any thoughts, any comments? Yeah, I think uh, my opinion on that, if I can, uh, the scripture we open in John, where Jesus says that if you love me, you will obey my commands. You will do what I yeah. command. I think for me, that is the, for me, is the best way to honor God is to, is to obey him, is to lead a life that he's, that he's calling me to, to make every effort with the help of the Holy Spirit, with the help of his word, with the, with the help of the community you know, to live a life that God is calling us all to, to be like Jesus. Amen. I would say that um, Saturday. I, would, I, I would think about my life. And in thinking of my life in how I engage with whoever I need to engage with, what I bring into my body, what I consume or what I take in, um, whether we're talking about drugs or we're talking about maybe it's smoking or it's uh, maybe being promiscuous, it could be um, a reflection of how I live my life. And I think um, it might be helpful if Annette is willing, it might be helpful to even unpack that and understand you know, where do you find yourself and, and how can you then practically apply that scripture so that it is meaningful for you? Um, and, and I think maybe um, because Annette and I have not met, I would recommend if you are comfortable um, through Raj and through um, Ronald, maybe we could connect down the line so that we can have a deeper, more meaningful conversation. Because it's easy to give examples, but sometimes the examples are not really applicable because we all find ourselves at different places in our lives. So um, that could be something you could think about, Annette. I think it's a, it's a wonderful question because then um, you, know, you engage with the scriptures, you engage with the Bible, and you want to see how you can make it applicable and practical. Those would be my thoughts. Thank you. Amen. Is this uh, Sharon? Um, yeah. Um, what comes to mind for me is the scripture that speaks about that we need to offer our bodies to Christ as a living sacrifice. And um, if I think about it, what... Um, when sacrifices were made um, in the temple, it was it needed to be blameless without fault. It could not have been a sick animal. God wanted something that was pure. And if I think of myself as a living sacrifice, that includes everything of me. It's it's my speech. It's what I look at. It's what I listen to. It's what I say. It's like what um, patients also said now, what I consume or whatever it is that I do with my body, um, is that pleasing unto God? Um, does it bring about, you know, that I am as pure as the sacrifices that he required before Jesus became the perfect sacrifice? And I think um, also taking with that is it is me becoming like Jesus in everything that I do and with whoever it is that I surround myself with. 
Thank you. Those are some great uh, responses. Uh, and uh, again, Annette, you're welcome to uh, post, I mean, link, click the link on your contact list if you would like someone to um, contact you, reach out to you. Uh, and I think that I love the communal aspect. I think Solly mentioned uh, Christianity is not a solo sport. We need each other to love each other and help each other. And also to, to remember that God is the one who actually wants us to be his temple. He wants us to be his indwelling space. And our, our role in it is to respond and say, here I am, Lord, I do want that. And, and that does involve us uh, turning away and laying down our lives. And at the same time, God himself is working in our lives. And so there's a, there's a combination of two. So it doesn't feel like it's all on me to fix me. Um, but ra rather it's really God who's working and us willingly participating. And we have others around us who can help us and share their lives with us and share their victories and struggles as well. And so to be the temple as a collective, which I find as refreshing, because imagine if it's all on me, that, that'd be quite a burden. <laughs> uh, Lo, I see your hand up. Yeah, thanks, Raj. Thanks for a great uh, and awesome lesson. Uh, uh, such an um, incredible just uh, thing for us to, to think about, about us being God's temple. And just thinking about that question and how, what you actually taught today was part of, of being God's temple is bringing God's presence or being God's presence to the world and, and almost restoring his presence to the world. So I, lo I love that concept. I think that answers part of the question as well is how do I honor God with my body is, is how do I bring God's presence to the world? And it ties in kind of with, with, I mean, you read from first Corinthians six, I think how we are personal bodies are God's temple. First Corinthians three talks about us as a collective also being God's temple. So maybe the question to us is, well, well how do we build God's temple uh, on our, with our bodies? You know, how can we serve uh, and, and bring God to the people and bring God to, you know, his temple, which is this church, basically Paul's talking about us as a community, bringing this, you know, this future community you showed us in Revelations. How do we bring this community to the world now? And I think that's so powerful because, because, and I love the point that you made where you're not alone. You have God's presence with you. And it's not like some sort of like the force awakens or whatever from Star Wars. It's not some impersonal party trick. It's God. God is with us. And sometimes we're so like, we think we're in the desert and we like, we're thirsty and we're hungry, but we forget the pillar of fire, the pillar of smoke, God's tabernacle right next to us, who's guiding us. And, and I think it's so powerful. So, so Raj, really appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you, Lo. Uh, Shivani, I see your hand is raised. Yes, uh, thank you, Raj. Um, you know, I, I think for me, I'm just thinking about um, how the temple in terms of, um, you know, God's, God's specifications in terms of how the temple was to be built and how God was so specific in terms of how it must be and all those things and also how the Israelites revered and it was for them an incredible symbol of God's been there with them that you know when it was destroyed and even with the exiles and how they wanted to rebuild because you know the the, the symbol or the sign of god's presence was now no more there so i'm also just thinking about you know god being specific in terms of how it needs to be and i think like what everyone said it's for us to look at you know whatever it is that god expects us to be but i think the other question that i had um, was you know in 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 matthew uh, 12 verse 31 you know when the bible says i just wanted to find out because i think it's been a question of mine and that I, I don't think I've, I've not really gotten an answer to but now when we are talking about the presence of god us taking the presence of god wherever we go so i always think of this scripture but i don't really know what it means so i'm not sure if you know it relates to us being the temple but in 12 Matthew 12 31 it says and so i tell you every kind of sin and slander can be forgiven but blasphemy against the spirit will not be forgiven 
So I don't know if, you know, it relates to what we are talking about today, but, you know, it's just something that I had in my mind, even as we are talking about us being the temple and taking God's presence, I was just thinking about it to say, you know, what is that that we can do against the spirit that will not be forgiven? Thank you. Thank you. That's a great question. Hello, uh, go ahead. Yeah, th thanks. Uh, Shumani, uh, that's actually a question somebody else posted already. So, so we're really busy putting together a whole portfolio uh, and, and we'll cover it, but, but maybe I can give you a short answer in terms of that. So, and Raj, please fill in if I'm missing something, but that's a really tough scripture right, to understand, but it's also always important when we read something like that to read it in context. So there's, there's a few of those of those scriptures and there's one in Luke as well and it talks if you look if you read the context if Jesus is having this uh, sort of discourse with the Pharisees and the Pharisees are accusing him of being of of the devil and and then Jesus does all these miracles to prove that what he says is true and they just refuse they refuse to believe what he's what he's doing in fact they are they're doing the opposite so they're saying okay so you're saying you're the son of God. You say you can forgive sins and you're proving it by miracles. But really, we reject you because we're saying all of that stuff is just, it's counterfeit. Satan is doing that. So they're making a conscious decision to reject the spirit. So Raj spoke about, and I spoke about it last week, how Jesus was bringing God's presence, his, his spirit. And they chose to say, no, we don't want you. And that's what that, in the context of what that's saying, it's saying, they were saying, you are not God and we don't want you. So that's kind of what Jesus is saying. Jesus says everything, I mean, just before that, he says all sin will be forgiven. But if you, if you decide to reject the spirit, if you talk against the spirit, and, 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 and if you just read it in that context, they were saying Jesus was possessed, right? He was driving out demons by the prince of demons. And uh, that's kind of what, what the blasphemy of the spirit is. It's when we re reject Jesus and it's not just sin that we do once, it's when we say, okay, we reject you as God, we choose another God, and, and we say you're, you're not God. And I think um, that's, not, that's not just one thing that the Pharisees did, this is almost like a lifestyle, it's almost like a, a life choice that they made to reject Jesus. So we'll, we'll get into that in a, bit, in a bit more, Shimani, but it, it kind of talks to, the, to what Roger was saying about honoring Jesus, because this is kind of like doing the, oh, sorry, honoring the spirit, because this is, kind of like doing the exact opposite. It's saying we refuse to be God's temple. And in fact, we're not even saying that. We're saying God is evil. <laughs> we are good and God is evil. That's basically what that sin is. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you, Lo. It does. Uh, yeah, I will read more into it. Thank you. Thank you. Any other thoughts on that question? Any other comments? Just a comment from our side. Um, just really enjoying uh, being a part of these discussions, uh, Raj and those. So it's, it's super uh, encouraging to, to listen to you gentlemen uh, so full of uh, God's presence, uh, teaching about God's presence. So I just want to honor you two both for, for um, putting time aside for us and uh, I look forward to the remaining um, session. So, so keep it up. Thank you. God be the glory. Amen. Thanks, Luke. Well, we have a few more minutes. Any other thoughts, comments, questions? Hi Raj, it's it's Pauline this side. Um, hi Pauline. Hi. Uh, thank you so much. I think this is this is such a powerful lesson to do uh, for for the church because I think you know the Holy Spirit is one part of a critical walk with the Holy Spirit uh, with with a with a Christian. I cannot imagine myself as a Christian without the Lord Holy Spirit with me, and I think. For me, the, the way I've always referred to him to help me understand that he's here with me is to refer to him as my Lord, 
my Lord, Holy Spirit. And, and I think, you know, as a Christian, you know, we get to learn, I mean, the, the, the Bible, the King James refers to the Holy Spirit as the Holy Ghost. So that can be confusing to say Holy Ghost and you can easily associate the Lord Holy Spirit with some ghost or, or something, you know, some, 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 some uh, spirit, but understanding who he is and, and his work in the life of a Christian is it's something that unlocks a mind of a human being to another level because you understand all the time that you've got this human with you that is helping you you know and and it's it's such a powerful um an empowering thought to have and to understand that we are with our lord all the time i mean i always imagine when i drive alone like sometimes you know i come from the rural areas with my dad and when i leave my dad in the evening he'll always say to me please drive carefully and I'll say to him, don't worry, I'm not driving. Somebody else is driving. But I refer to the Lord Holy Spirit who's driving the car and who'll get me home safe. Because there's so many times that I, I think that I'll get home safe, but I don't even know how I got home. Honestly, I'm like, I just see myself home. How I got home, I don't know. But it's, it's just how he represent God in today's life and and also teaching my daughter to understand that you know back in the old testament God appeared you know to his people and then in the new testament Jesus appeared to his disciples now we've got the Lord Holy Spirit with us and he is here with me with her all the time when she goes to school so this is such an empowering class that I wish we can be even able to take it further to the service to those that are not able to connect during the week to learn more about who we are in God. You know, I type the reincarnation. It can be confusing, but when you understand that you have been born again, you now have somebody else who lives in you. I mean, the sister asked a question, how do I then, um, you know, glorify God with my body? When you've got a new person in you, he takes over. You know, you understand that swearing is a language that cannot come out of your mouth because you've got a new person in you. The Lord Holy Spirit is in charge and he talks to you through your conscience to ensure that you are not the person that you used to be before. A very passionate, um, a very passionate uh, 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 teaching that is very close to my heart, a, 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 a subject that I love very much uh, talking about the Holy Spirit because I've seen God so many times in my life. Thank you. Thank you, Pauline, that's awesome. Thank you for sharing and thank you for your passion and then, you know, I think you, I think you wrapped it up really well. <laughs> well, next Amen. week we're gonna we're gonna talk about the work of the Holy Spirit, and we'll have Lo uh, come back and teach next Tuesday, seven to eight. We'll have the recording of this lesson on our Facebook and YouTube channel. Uh, Ronald, maybe you can send the link or uh, where people could find this on our chat group, that'd be very helpful. Uh, and then uh, I see Baba Andrew has his hand up. So Baba Andrew, please, you can maybe close us out as you share your comments and also close us out in prayer, please. Thank you. <laughs> ah, Raj. Hey, good <laughs> evening, everybody. Um, I, I just want to say thank you, Raj, for uh, today's lesson. Um, Okay, I, I have to confess my sins. I, I, I dozed off during the, during the class. But, uh, you know, my wife was here. She sort of woke me up. I, I remember the first part where you spoke about uh, 
the Garden of Eden, God wanting to reside with us. Um, and, and, and I think that uh, it, it makes so much sense uh, to, to teach that uh, in the class of the Holy Spirit, because uh, we also understand that uh, our bodies, uh, the Bible says that they, they are the temple where God resides. Um, and so I think uh, it, it connects very well with um, the teaching about God wanting to us. And, and, and you know, uh, and, and, and when, 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 when the Lord left, he promised that uh, the Holy Spirit will, uh, he will send the Holy Spirit to be with us. And so uh, also just to add on what Paulino was saying, it's, 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 uh, it's true that uh, the Holy Spirit is, is always with us. And uh, I think uh, uh, I, I like the way you connected this Holy Spirit lesson with uh, the Genesis story. You know, you, you always hear people say, um, Genesis is, is, is that's it. If you understand Genesis, you got it. You know, and, and there's so much in Genesis that uh, we can learn. I am grateful that you connected that uh, so well with the Holy Spirit um, study. Thank you, bro. Thank Amen. you, Brother Andrew. Thank you. Thank you for your openness and, uh, and vulnerability. Yeah, I apologize. I, I, I just those. No worries. No worries. Thank you. Amen. You can Amen. teach prayer. I, I, Amen. Thank let's uh, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, um, my Father, thank you so much for the revelations that um, we continue to receive um, using your servants, Raj and everybody else that spoke today, Lo, Pauline, and all the other, Shumani, all the other people that spoke. Thank you so much for uh, continuing to talk to us, dear God. Uh, thank you for, for your miracles. Uh, us sitting here and hearing your word uh, in this way is a miracle on its own. We praise and give you all the honor and the glory uh, for times like these. Because there, here is where we um, uh, are making a decision to sit at the feet of our Lord Jesus and to eat of your word, dear Heavenly Father, to feed um, the spirit that is within us. Thank you so much, dear God. I pray that, um, these words will live within us and these words will impact our lives so that the decisions we make, the actions we take, the thoughts we think, Father, will be influenced by your word. I pray that you will continue um, to reveal these mysteries to us. Yes, there are many questions, dear God. Uh, one is the one that Shumani asked that we always wonder what does God really mean? But we are grateful for um, uh, platforms like these uh, that uh, we, we can learn, dear God. And the, Father, there are many questions and I pray that uh, uh, as we go along, dear God, uh, uh, you will answer all, if not most of these questions that we have about the scriptures. I pray that... Uh, we will uh, keep an open mind. I pray that uh, we will stick with the, uh, with the series and, and be present as much as we can, dear God. I pray that uh, Holy Spirit will continue to do his work in um, uh, giving us understanding, dear God. I thank you so much. I pray all of this in the mighty name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen.